member, uh, Carmen Chavez, who is going to talk about um, the overturning of the ADT and also the, the more recent fight for transgender inclusion uh, in the U.S. military. Hi, my name is Karma Chavez, and I am uh, uh, Against Equality Corps member, and I'm going to be doing the military portion of our presentation today. Um, really glad that you have us here to speak, and I'm going to be reading just to make sure you know we get everything right. So, um, if you see me looking down, I'm just looking at my script. So here we go. After the repeal of the U.S. military's "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" policy in 2010 and the rollout of its implementation, most gays and lesbians in the United States praised the policy change. Their argument usually went something like this. We may not support militarism, but people should still be able to serve. Or, given that it's mostly poor people and people of color who serve in the military, being against military inclusion is like taking a stand against poor people or queer people of color. Now, we've always disagreed with these arguments, maintaining that we should not support U.S. military imperialism and impunity under any conditions, or allow gays and lesbians to be used as a foil for the alleged spread of freedom and democracy via expanded militarism. We also believe that we should not support the U.S. military as the only unemployment and jobs program for poor people and people of color in the U.S. But we lost, so isn't this debate over? Well, in July of 2013, the Palm Center, a policy and research center focused on enhancing the quality of public dialogue on controversial issues, announced a new multi-year research initiative in order to assess the possibility for transgender inclusion in the U.S. military. The key question for this initiative is whether it is possible to include transgender troops without undermining military readiness. The research will analyze other militaries who already have uh, transgender people, as well as assess transgender inclusion in police and fire departments, policies of prisons and athletic organizations and the like. As legal scholar and activist, as well as AE contributor Dean Spade has noted, this call for new research, and hence the naming of this issue as key to the transgender movement, has emerged as a result of a large $1.35 million grant by the Tawani Foundation founded by Jennifer Natalia Pritzker, an heir to the Hyatt Fortune, a recently out trans woman, and a formal colonel in the National Guard. Now, Speed's critics argue that the issue is not one being put on the agenda because of one wealthy donor, but that organizations have been fighting this for over a decade. But nevertheless, the issue made headlines in July 2013 for the first time, drawing attention to it as a key concern for LGBT inclusion in an unprecedented way. Meanwhile, as Spade and others have repeatedly noted, trans and gender nonconforming people, especially the poor and people of color, remain among the most likely to suffer from discrimination, violence, homelessness, and premature death, and how military inclusion addresses these concerns of the broader trans community is unclear. But there are more reasons that this debate is not yet over. The pathway to inclusion reflected in the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal and implementation are also the same logic being adopted more broadly by the U.S. military and security apparatuses. In June 2009, Barack Obama picked up the tradition of the Clinton administration deeming June LGBT Pride Month. After his 2012 declaration, institutions including the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, and U.S. Customs and Border Patrol began officially celebrating Pride recognizing their, their LGBT employees groups and providing training for staff about the importance of LGBT inclusion to each institution's mission. Now, these events clearly coincide with the broader implementation of the repeal of DADT. And to be sure, all people should be able to work in jobs where they are respected, treated with dignity, and are safe. But it is important to interrogate some of the ways in which this inclusionary rhetoric is being offered by these institutions each tasked with perpetuating militarism and militarization. Well, let's begin with the Department of Defense, which celebrated Pride for the first time in 2012. Then DOD General Counsel, now head of the Department of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, was the keynote speaker. Now, during his speech, Johnson made it clear that he was not an activist on the matter of gay men and women in the United States. And in fact, he entered into the sustained study of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal without any particular outcome in mind. After revisiting some of the now familiar results from the study, Johnson also noted that the following long quotation had a lot of impact on the ultimate recommendation that the risks of repeal would be low. And I'm going to read 
a good chunk of this year. He said, this is a quote from the report. In the course of our assessment, it became apparent to us that aside from the moral and religious objections to homosexuality, much of the concern about open service is driven by misperceptions and stereotypes. Repeatedly, we heard service members express the view that open homosexuality would lead to widespread and overt displays of feminine behavior among men, homosexual promiscuity, harassment and unwelcome advances within units, invasions of privacy, and an overall erosion of standards of conduct, unit cohesion, and morality. Based on our review, however, we conclude these concerns about gay and lesbian service members are exaggerated and not consistent with the reported experiences of many service members. In communications with gay and lesbian current and former service members, we repeatedly heard a patriotic desire to serve and defend the nation, subject to the same rules as everyone else. From them, we heard uh, express many of the same values that we heard over and over again from service members at large, love of country, honor, respect, integrity, and service over self." End quote. Johnson goes on. And last but not least was this noteworthy quote in the report, which seems to be a favorite of a lot of people. We have a guy in the unit, a gay guy in the unit. He's big, he's mean, and he kills lots of bad guys. No one cared that he was gay. And Johnson's remarks are incredibly telling about the risks and stakes of inclusion. First are the concerns that presumably straight service members had about what open service would mean. Gross displays of male femininity, increased sexual harassment, presumably from gay men to straight men, unwanted advances, advances again presumably from gay men to straight men, and an overall decrease in morale. Now, Johnson calls these stereotypes and misconceptions, and they may very well be that. At the very same time that these concerns doubly function to codify the misogyny of the military, as straight men clearly seem to worry both about the correlation between an increasingly feminine environment and diminishing morale, at the same time that they worry about being put in a feminized position as the victims, not perpetrators, of harassment and unwanted advances. And there's no mention of sexual assault, but certainly that anxiety is present too. Now, Johnson would not, of course, be expected to take this as an opportunity to critique the existing misogyny of, and sexism embedded in military culture. But instead, he continues with the quotation which unsurprisingly confronts the misperceptions with images of and words from good soldiers, those who we imagine would share their straight comrades uh, with their straight comrades at disgust at an increasingly feminized military. In fact, these patriotic service members wanted to be subject to the same rules as everyone else and have no desire to advance a social agenda. And those are quotes. These homonationals then not only have no interest in changing business as usual, even if business as usual is violent toward them and others like them, they want to prove everyone wrong. Some will go to great lengths to do it, a point proven by the quote favorite quotation in the report. Again, we have a gay guy in the unit. He's big, he's mean, and he kills lots of bad guys. No one cared that he was gay. Just like allowing women in combat doesn't make for a kinder and gentler military, gays in the military do not lead to a more open and accepting environment. Instead, if we are to consider the logic that Johnson espouses here, gays can be just as mean and murderous as straight me service members. And when they are able to prove the possession of such characteristics, the fact of their gayness is no concern at all, at least, we presume, for mean, bad guy killing gay men. But what about those bad guys? In 2013, the DOD upped the ante, celebrating its first ever pride in the Kandahar province in southern Afghanistan, one of the bloodiest and deadliest regions of the entire duration of Operation Enduring Freedom, better known as the War in Afghanistan. The DOD put out a short minute-long video to commemorate the event from the Kandahar airfield. I don't want to be treated special, I just want to be treated equal. It's been a little under two years since President Obama signed the repeal of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. And service members deployed to Afghanistan were allowed to observe lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender pride. People came to support people that they didn't even know. They just knew that it, they were part of the LGBT community and they wanted to come support us. I think that right there shows how forward the armed forces is getting ready to go. It makes my military service well worth it. I think that everything that I experienced, everything that I went through, was worth it in the end. If the men and women who are wearing the uniform now get to openly serve as 
gay, lesbian, or bisexual, I think that it was it was worth it in the end. What does celebrating LGBT pride in Afghanistan mean to the United States? I think it's very important that we are here representing the United States of America and we hope that when we leave here we have less po all positive qualities and what America is like and that we're an equal country. We treat all our citizens equally. Reporting from Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan, I'm Marine Corporal Kaz Cruel. Now finding reports of the exact numbers of civilian casualties in Afghanistan is very difficult and it's even more difficult to find accurate reports of locations of the deaths and the exact causes of those deaths. But the United Nations Assistance Mission Afghanistan released a report on civilian deaths and injuries from January 1st to June 30th, 2013, titled Afghanistan Protection of Civilians in Armed Conflict. The report concludes, escalating deaths and injuries to Afghan children, women, and men led to a 23% resurgence in civilian casualties in the first six months of 2013 compared to the same period in 2012. The mission documented 1,319 civilian deaths and 2,533 injuries from January to June 2013, marking a 14% increase in deaths, 28% increase in injuries, and 23% increase in total civilian casualties compared to the same period in 2012. The rise in civilian casualties in the first half of 2013 revises the decline recorded in 2012 and marks a return to the high numbers of civilian deaths and injuries documented in 2011. As the report simply put it, civilians again increasingly bore the brunt of the armed conflict in Afghanistan in early 2013. Civilians, particularly in conflict-affected areas, experienced the grim reality of rising civilian deaths and injuries coupled with pervasive violence which threaten lives, livelihood, and well-being of thousands of Afghans. Now, I'm not sure how we reconcile the image of a young general enlist, marine, or soldier who doesn't want special treatment but just wants to be treated equal with horrifying images, such as the report's cover image of terrified people running literally for their lives. Are their lives and deaths the price of equality, as so many inclusion champions suggest? Is the carnage of the now-inclusive war machine just an example of how freedom isn't free? Or is this entire scenario something far more complex and perhaps sinister? How should LGB and soon-to-be T people respond to our inclusion? Thanks a lot. So to start, uh, the LGBT inclusive federal hate crime law in the United States, which is commonly referred to as you see up here uh, as the Matthew Shepard Act, was enacted into law as part of the 2010 National Defense Authorization Act. For people that don't know what that is, that's the bill that Congress has to pass to fund the military. So protection, state protections for LGBT people was tacked onto a military budget bill. So think about that. Um, so for those who are not aware how hate crime law works, uh, they function by increasing penalties for acts of violence or intimidation that are already illegal, right? So uh, harassment, verbal harassment, uh, assault, rape, murder, all these things are already illegal. But if it can be proven that the violence was carried out with anti-LGB, or carried out and motivated by anti-LGBT sentiment, this is then a hate crime and penalty enhancement. Penalty enhancements can be enacted. Uh, hate crime legislation in the United States has its roots in the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which protected victims of violence based on race, color, religion, and national origin. Uh, these protections were expanded in 2000, uh, 1994 to include gender-based violence against women and in 2009 to include perceived gender, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. So regardless of the effectiveness of these laws, which have already been called into question, and here's one of many, many examples, uh, by feminists, people of color, and queer activists, uh, us as a collective and as prison abolitionists oppose any expansion of the prison industrial complex including the expansion of policing, surveillance, and prosecutorial powers of the carceral state, even when such expansions are supposedly enacted on our own behalf or for our own safety. 
Historically, we know that neither prisons nor the carceral state have ever protected us from violence, and in fact have been and continues to be the site of violence for queer, trans, and gender nonconforming people, particularly those who are also of low income, people of color, immigrants, young people, sex workers, and or drug users. Um, and I'm just going to show two quick examples to jog our memories about how um, the state, of, state and the prison industrial complex has not historically worked out for us. Um, so I was born in Rhode Island. I like to point out it's this nice dark orange one in the sea of yellow. Um, so gay sex <laughs> was illegal while I was in high school. Um, and I left uh, Rhode Island when I was a teenager. Um, but thinking about how um, sodomy laws were used, only targeted, uh, pr pr primarily targeted um, gay men, uh, even though sodomy can be enacted by all sorts of people. Um, but thinking about how laws are unevenly um, pursued against uh, uh, um, citizens of the country. Um, and secondly, also thinking about um, sort of cultural artifacts, so not just thinking about public policy, but also thinking about cultural um, situations like this film, Boys Beware, which is about uh, the stranger danger of uh, gay men are in the bushes waiting for your children um, kind of scenario. But this film was actually produced by a retired uh, police sheriff from Southern California. Um, so thinking about the ways in which um, even retired people who have involvement with the police force can still create these cultural objects um, that uh, actually inform how policing uh, and community safety is, is, is taught to young people. Um, so these are just, again, two examples of thinking about how these, how laws have historically not worked out um, to our own favor. Um, uh, another point, uh, uh, coming back to the hate crimes legislation, um, the scholar Chandan Reddy points out in his 2011 book, Freedom of Violence, that the Matthew Shepard Act was passed with specific uh, penalties for young offenders. Um, so with that in mind, with the already disproportionate surveillance, policing, arrests, and convictions for people of color in the U.S. context, it's fair to assume that hate crime legislation will actually have a disproportionate impact on the lives of young people of color. So as a collective, we use uh, this critique of hate crime legislation to provide an opening for a broader queer critique of the prison industrial complex. Um, as we previously noted, marriage, military service, and hate crimes law serves as the sort of holy trinity of contemporary gay and lesbian assimilationist politics in the US. But it's through this critique of the hetero status quo that we try to build broader uh, political critiques. Um, and here, we're talking about the prison industrial complex. And I wanted to point out um, uh, Dean Spade, who wrote the introduction to the section on prisons and hate crime legislation in our book. Um, uh, uh, proposes five <laughs> myth-busting facts in the opening of uh, that book, and I think it's really helpful to just quickly review those five um, to get us thinking about the prison industrial complex more broadly. So he states, one, uh, jails and prisons are not overflowing with violent and dangerous people, but with poor, the disabled, and people of color. Two, most violence does not happen on the street between strangers, but between people who know each other in places they are familiar with. Uh, the most dangerous people and those who destroy and end the most lives are on the outside running our banks, governments, courtrooms, uh, and are wearing military and police uniforms. Four, prison, prisons aren't places to put serial rapists and murderers. They are, in self, in, they are in themselves serial rapists and murderers. And five, increasing criminalization does not make us safer. It simply feeds the voracious law enforcement system that devours our communities and often for profit. Um, and so this, is the, this is where that, those five points come from. Um, important to note, uh, just on that note about profit uh, and, and criminalization for profit, um, the U.S. prison system, and to some degree in Canada as well, is relying more and more upon public-private partnerships in which the uh, government actually contracts out private corporations to build prisons and run them. Um, and so what do we know about when there's a profit motive involved? in doing anything, uh, right? profit becomes the goal. So how do these, these prison corporations make money off of numerous things within the prison, but the main one is right. the more beds you have full, the more you can build the government for um, managing people's bodies in the prison system. So what these corp the Correction corp Corporation of America is one of the largest, but what these people do is then use the profits from running these prisons to set up lobby groups that lobby for tougher uh, uh, penalties for even less and less uh, infractions. Uh, and so the idea is to keep people in prison longer and put more people in prison for smaller infractions. So this is happening in about a little bit over 12% of prisons in the US right now run on this model. Um, so we have to be thinking about how this um, 
for-profit uh, prison system? What is the relationship that queer people have to this for-profit prison system if we're depending on the prison industrial complex and the state to protect us? Right? What does it mean to be implicitly uh, uh, involved with that, that sort of system and organizing? Uh, it's also important to think about how, how hate crime law um, obscures anti-queer and anti-trans senti sentiment and violence by making it personal, right? So like a bad person does a bad thing uh, while leaving structural forms of violence in place. So police officers, the National Guard, the US military, border guards, <coughs> excuse me, immigration and custom enforcement officers, ICE detention guards, prison guards, homeland security, and private security firms, the people, these people and the institutions they uphold will never be charged with a hate crime for the violence they uphold and inflict. And instead, uh, which may, not, may or may not be surprising to some folks, is that there's more and more cases popping up where the laws that were intended to protect minorities are being used to prosecute them. For example, in Boston, 2012, three African-American lesbians were charged with an anti-gay hate crime for assaulting another gay man. And hate crime charges have also been brought against African-American teenager in Brooklyn for assaulting a white couple in October of 2013 and this is what Paul Butler, who's the author of Let's Get Free, a Hip Hop Theory of Justice, points out as the use of hate crime legislation to, def to defend majority populations from minority populations. Worse yet, are the hate crime charges being brought, sought against African American youths in the aftermath of the 2001 Cincinnati race riots, spurned by the shooting death of an unarmed black man by a white police officer. That story sounds too familiar, uh, and I want to this is, this is a slide I, I added in um, because it's, it's quite recent in its uh, occurrence. Uh, but I think this really sort of should put the nail in the coffin of anyone who believes hate crime legislation is a good idea. Um, here we have a letter from the Fraternal Order of Police, which is the largest federal police union in the United States. <coughs> and in this letter, um, Chuck Canterbury, the national president, points out that the FOP has been fighting for the inclusion of police officers in hate crimes legislation for the last decade. And after the assassination <coughs> deaths of those two police officers in New York City, uh, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests in New York, um, now reaffirming the demand for hate crime protections for police officers, right? So, by this, I'm sorry, just so yeah. that I totally understand, you mean that Police officers are arguing that they are a protected class. They should be a protected class, yeah. Yeah, that, that is what's happening, right? So that means assaulting a police officer would be a hate crime, right? And if we know anything about organizing on the left, um, people are charged with assaulting a police officer all the time for uh, d just defending themselves or not doing anything, right? Um, so this should be terrifying to everyone on the left, but particularly to people who are victims of police violence on a regular basis, right? Um, so again, thinking about, you know, we can pass all these laws and do all these reforms, but at the same time, those laws and reforms can actually be used against us because the actual criminal punishment system has no context for social context or power, right? Um, it doesn't take into context racialized power structures or uh, hetero supremacy within this context, right? The laws applied evenly, and that means that it can be used against minority populations despite the fact that it, its history comes out with a different, a different goal. So as a collective, using this uh, critique of hate crimes legislation, uh, we, we hope to open up a more radical, critical, queer lens uh, to the prison industrial complex um, and to open up people's eyes to other issues um, relating to queers, uh, transgender people, and gender nonconforming people in the prison. Um, so some of these things that we talk about in the book, and I'll have some images up here, um, are the criminalization of self-defense as seen in the case of New Jersey 4 and C.C. McDonald, the profiling of trans women, particularly trans women of color, the anti-gay witch hunts against school teachers and daycare workers, uh, which were many of were cases <coughs> of uh, childhood sexual abuse, and uh, the specific cases of the San Antonio 4, Bernard Baran, and Stephen and Melvin Matthews are talked about in the book. Um, um, amongst many others. Uh, also, the criminalization of HIV non-disclosure and exposure laws that disproportionately, of course, impact and affect gay and bisexual men, um, and also particularly men of color in the United States and Canada. Also, the legacy of brutal and ineffective laws organized around concepts of uh, sexual deviancy. So these are sex offender laws and civil commitment, which again disproportionately impact uh, queer and trans and gender non-conforming people. Um, and each of these are explored at length in the book. Um, so I won't continue to go into detail of them because I want to stop talking and open the floor. 
Um, but in conclusion, uh, I just want to say that um, our goal here isn't simply to critique uh, the criminal punishment <coughs> system for the sake of problematizing it, but to open up space so that we can actually ask really serious questions about how do we open up pathways towards restorative justice models that move beyond this sort of punitive response to violence. Um, and these models, the punitive model, right, often, more often than not, compounds issues rather than resolves issues uh, by repairing the harm done and the dignity of all those in involved. Uh, and as a collective, we collectively point our fingers at uh, our sort of uh, spineless uh, liberal and conservative politicians who perennially use a get tough on crime rhetoric uh, to win elections, uh, when in reality we'd love to see them actually get tough on the causes of crime. Um, and this would be actually addressing things like poverty, inadequate safe and affordable housing, inadequate healthy food and water, lack of resources and treatment for drug users, lack of meaningful education and employment opportunities, lack of access to health care, racist and exploitative immigration policies. And again, we sort of associate all these things with uh, this current iteration of capitalism that we're experiencing at this moment. Uh, we really look forward to a day when this becomes the focus of our political leaders as opposed to uh, putting more people in prisons and getting tough on so-called crime. Um, but as a collective, we also know that this shift only comes through a combination of both fierce critique and political grassroots political action. Uh, and we see the collective work we're doing as, as part of that process, um, or at least we'd like to think it is. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to stop talking. Um, I missed a slide, it's OK. Um, and I, yeah, I'd really love to, to answer questions if there's questions, but I, I also want to make it more of a dialogue for sure. Um, and thanks for listening for an hour.